Well, open your Bibles to uh, Romans. Open them to Romans chapter 12. We continue our journey through Romans, and we're talking about the church that God uses. How many of you know, how many of you believe that God wants to use the church right now? He actually has a desire in his heart to use the church in this season to make a difference. Are you with me? More than make a scene, make a difference. Are you with me on that too? And uh, we've been looking at how practical that is. What does the Christian life look like going forward? And we talked about uh, from chapter 12 on, Paul begins to help lay out for the Roman, the church, the church in Rome, what practical Christian doctrine in a hostile culture looks like. What does it look like? How does the church live in a culture that doesn't know, understand what they think, doesn't abide by the same values, doesn't have the same uh, basic uh, undergirding of thought and, and belief and philosophy, that is at the same time uh, a culture that is in power uh, in every way and can at any moment impose upon the church anything it wants to do at any time? How does the church live and make a difference in a hostile culture. And so he's first saying, hey, listen, it starts with you and me starting every day saying, God, the time on this earth belongs to you. My time, this body is yours. And I come willingly and I offer it like a living sacrifice. And as I offer my life as a living sacrifice, I then say, God, would you transform my, my mind, my thinking? The culture is always trying to form me into its image. And so I'm going to come before your word, and I'm going to come before your presence, and I'm going to ask you regularly, would you transform me? Because the goal of Christian discipleship is very simple. It's that we look more like Jesus. That's the goal. The measurement of whether or not that's happening is the quality of how we love. And so he moved from the goal and we started looking at what does genuine love look like? And we talked about what it looks like in the body, how we treat one another, how we serve one another. And it begins to expand out today, not just from how we treat each other in the body to how do we love people who are hard to love? How do we love what does authentic spirituality look like in the face of hostility? What happens when it's hard to love someone? The title this, this week is Bridge Builders, and I wanted a title that will give you the picture of what we're talking about and the picture of our time on earth and what God wants to do in our lives and how he wants to use us in a culture like today. And the picture is bridge building. And I want you to keep that picture in your head. When you see a bridge, it's there for a reason, right? It's there to span a gap of some sort, whether it's a river or a, a canyon. It's there to take two divided parties and bring them together. It covers that gap. That's what a bridge does. And the church is called to be a bridge builder in the same manner that Jesus was a bridge builder to you and to me. He came from heaven to close and build a bridge across the gap you and I could never cross. Are you with me? And that gap was my rebellion, my selfishness, and my sin, and the perfection of a holy God who only loves always. And in my relationship with God, there was a giant chasm between the two. And he said, because he loved the world so much, he could not allow that chasm to just sit there unattended. He had to make a way, so he sent his son Jesus into the world to be a bridge builder, to make it possible for me to go from here to there, make it possible for his love to go from there to my heart. Jesus was the bridge. He made a way, and he's wanting to make that way still today in people's lives. But his means of that is the church. That's what we have to keep in front of us foremost, or we'll get caught up 
and lots of other things that we're supposed to be about that we're not supposed to be about. What is in front of you and me is the calling of being a person who helps build a bridge. And the only context for that bridge is relationship that allows the love of God to go from heaven into the heart of a person, just like Jesus did for us. We're called to build a bridge. In our culture today, these culture wars that are so heavy, they're so great, they're so strong, the culture wars are constantly dividing people. They're pushing people to one side or another side. It's been happening for years. In our culture, our context today, it's very strong. I spoke with someone right before service who was telling me how just the idea of masks is dividing their family on two lines and they're all believers. And yet they're allowing the issue of masks to divide their relationship and create a divide instead of finding the way to the bridge. Everything I share today comes from the word of God. Just hear me loud and clear. I have a very strong agenda and I know it. (laughs) My agenda is to teach God's word on how we show genuine love in a culture and a season that's full of hostility causes a bridge to be built and not a divide to be widened. And it will wreck you. I warn you now, it will wreck you. I warn you watching online, it's a good time to turn it off right now. Just (laughs) Then just plead ignorance. I didn't read the passage. I don't really know what God requires of me. I'm good to go. But what he invites us into, and we won't get it right every time, And it's a culture of people who are learning, right? We're becoming like Christ. But it's what we're saying is, I'm okay with this, Lord, this process of transforming me into your image. And my understanding of what that looks like is what genuine love, how that plays out in my life. How does genuine love build bridges? So we're gonna turn to this passage of scripture in Romans chapter 12. I'm gonna read it, then I'll give you the points so you know where we're going in advance. And I'll give you the context for what he and how he writes it. And then we will go into those points one at a time. Sound good? Romans chapter 12, verse 14. The continuation of this conversation of genuine love. Not fake love, not hypocritical love, but what real love is. This is the measure of our spirituality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Be loved. Never revenge yourselves. But leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with, say it with me, good. Overcome evil with good. Last week, we talked about the verse that comes right after genuine love. And he says, abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. And what he's about to give us in how we do this is a picture of what to stay away from. What has no business in the life of a Christian, of a follower of Christ, of genuine love. And what to hold on to, what to cling to. Here's the picture of the interplay. And in the Greek, it doesn't come out perfectly in the English, but in the Greek, in this passage of scripture we're looking at, there are four negative imperatives that come out that are really the hallmark of the passage we're looking at today. Negative imperatives in that they are telling us what not to do. And he gives us four things not to do. And so I'm going to keep those because they're the clear things. They, They help me the most. 
sort through the crud of how am I supposed to live this? They just help me know this is never okay for Pastor Ryan, just so you know. It's not okay for me. It's what not to do, and I'm going to give you the positive of what to do that goes with it so you remember the positive part, okay? Four things. Bless. That's the positive. What do I not do? He says, do not curse. It doesn't mean don't swear, say a bad word. It means do not pronounce curse on somebody. Don't want their harm. Bless. Secondly, forgive. Do not repay evil is the imperative. Don't repay it. Thirdly, give grace. Do not avenge yourself. Fourthly, break the cycle. Do not be overcome by evil. Break the cycle that's now started. Are you with me? Those four things. Here we go. Let's talk about bless. Verse 14, he says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. That word for bless literally means to speak well of, speak well of, to want good for. Especially those, it says, persecute is this idea of those who are going after you, whether it is systematic harassment or persecution, they're coming after you. Those who are pestering, those who are antagonistic, those who are whatever, whatever whenever you feel like they're coming after me, I'm being targeted, I'm the, 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 the ire, the, uh, they put their eyes on me for harm, whatever, that, that's persecuting. And he says, here's what, speak well of those who are intentionally coming after you. If I could stop right now, drop the mic and walk off the stage, that would be enough for us to look at this week. Am I wrong? I hope they get a taste of I hope they get what's coming to them. Oh, they're putting all this into making this happen, and I just wait till it catches up with them. I hope somebody wrecks their car. Well, I hope his wife leaves him. I hope they get sick with COVID and they see what it's like. Come on. That's what he's talking about. Don't wish their harm. Don't wish negative outcomes on them. He says live in harmony. The whole context of this is stay free to meet people where they are emotionally. Don't allow such a divide between those who persecute you and you that when things come into their life, you cannot either rejoice when they're happy with them because you so want their harm. So something good, they get a promotion and you're like, eh, good for you. I'll eat the cake in the lunchroom. But uh, every whole time I'm going, just wait till you fall. Wait till you fall. But he says, have such a genuine approach to wanting people's good that you can love them, rejoice with them when they're rejoicing. That when something negative does happen in their life, you're not going, eee. you're saying, let me, let me walk with you, let me cry with you, let me weep with those who weep. That's what harmony is. It's meeting people where they're at emotionally. I can join you there because I genuinely care and I didn't allow myself to want curse for you. I wanted good for you. So now as it's coming or however it is, I can meet you where you are. Does that make sense? And that's the picture. It's so interesting though how easy we just slip. I mean culture, divide, the cultural divide between the two. If I can, if I can see you on the other side as an other thing over there, if, if you're that, like, it's like I was at the Dodger game for the, for the wild card game. 
I was there. We were there to see the Dodgers win, right? It was the Dodgers and the Cardinals. And I only saw two in the stadium, but there might have been more, but I recall looking and seeing two people different times dressed in full Giants gear at Dodger Stadium for our wild card game. (laughs) And my frame of mind was Dodger fan frame of mind. Dodger fan frame of mind is your very presence here offends me. (laughs) And I glared at a guy just walking by him. The audacity. You don't even belong in the stadium. We're not even playing you. Are you only here so you can rub it in if somehow we get knocked out of the playoffs? Why else would you be here? And I was looking for them after the game, man. I wanted to, I just wanted to see them. Look them in the eyes. Yeah, you wasted your money. Now we're coming for you. That's what I wanted to say. And I was preparing the message and I was reflecting on that. <laughs> Easy observations for me are things like this. As soon as I objectify you into a party, You are those people over there. I take away from you or from myself my responsibility to love you. You're over there. You're part of that. I don't, I'm not responsible to love you. You're a Giants fan. (laughs) And as soon as I allow my heart that freedom, then I can just go there. And what he says to us is, don't allow your heart that freedom with anybody, especially those who are your rivals, who are rivals to you, who are antagonistic, who show up at Dodger games wearing Giants gear for no reason. Don't allow your heart to go there. Now, that's a funny example. I wasn't really going to do him harm. But if he had spilled ketchup all over his jersey or something like that happened to him, I probably would have laughed. And I probably would have celebrated inside. The application, do not curse others. Very simple, speak well and desire good for everyone. Like I said, I could stop right there. And that's enough. But he goes on to keep talking about what love is. To be a follower of Jesus, to love like him. Do not repay evil, forgive. He says in verse 17, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. There are things he says to abhor evil and to cling to good. And he gives us a picture. This is what you stay away from. This is what you say, this is not okay for me. So when I'm living in that world, I say, Holy Spirit, would you help me away from there? I don't want anything to do with that kind of a heart, that kind of hypocritical love. But cling to this. Make sure, he says, your conduct is above reproach by only doing good. Do not repay evil. It's not suggesting that you become a people pleaser when he says do what is pleasing in the sight of all. He's not talking about becoming a people pleaser. Yes, whatever the culture wants you to do, you do that. He's saying in the sight of all, be a peacemaker. Because ultimately, our culture does want peace. People don't like living in this constant volatile tension. Am I right? Nobody's enjoying sides and parties and and families being ripped apart before Thanksgiving over masks and vaccines and all of the stupid things that would divide people today. Nobody likes that. It doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel good. And it's certainly not the life of the kingdom that Jesus came to bring us. Am I right? That's why it's the good news of the kingdom of God. It's a different way of living than the world lives today. It's different. And you and I get to bring that. It's different. Instead of returning evil on people or evil on others who've done evil to us, that's the picture. You you do something to me, I do something to you. Right? You curse at me, I curse at you. 
You key my car, I key your car. And he's saying, that's not how we live. That's how the world lives, yeah. That might be how everybody does everything. But that's not how we live. That's not my love flowing through you. So check it. Instead of returning evil on us for the evil done to him, Jesus gave us another way. He said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. We read later the very first Christian martyr, Stephen, as he's being stoned, as he's being stoned to death, says, Father, do not hold this sin against them. I believe those are the very words that changed the life of a man who was there named Saul, who became Paul, who wrote Romans that we're reading right now. Father, forgive them. If possible, live at peace. Live peaceably with all. That is our heritage. Elizabeth Elliot, some of you know her story. Elizabeth Elliot was the wife of Jim Elliot who felt called to witness to the Akua tribe. And on his very landing and first contact, him and those who were with him were all immediately killed and martyred. And Elizabeth Elliot decided to stay the wife of the man who had been killed and to share the love of Jesus with the tribe who had taken her husband from her. And it was her act of forgiveness that caused them to stop and wonder what on earth is going on here. And then she was able to preach the forgiveness of Jesus that she had received, that I had received, and they listened. C.S. Lewis says, everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. But it is our heritage. Christ in me had already gone before us. He already went ahead of us and showed us what it's like. Now, I know that is not an easy way to live, but that is God's way through my life. That's not an easy way to love, but that is what genuine love is. Sincere love, that's what it is. And it's different than the world. And it's desperately something our world needs today. Do not repay evil for evil. Seek to make peace and relational reconciliation possible. Make that the goal. That's what you cling to. How can I make peace possible? How can I bring sides together? That is my aim. That's my aim. That's our aim. And then he says, give grace. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary. Now, if he had stopped right there, let's just stop. He gave us the thing to not be about. Don't be about vengeance. That is not, that's what you abhor. Don't hold on to that. Stay away from that. But he didn't just say, don't be a person who is always trying to avenge yourself. He said, instead, do something totally different. Come at it with an opposite spirit. And what is the opposite spirit? Give grace. Give them grace. Well, they don't deserve it. That's the definition of grace. They don't deserve that I would feed them, give them water, be kind to them when they were mean to me, when they harmed me, when they whatever. What they deserve is justice. And if I can't get it some other way, I'm going to get it my own way. And he says, find a different way. He says, give them grace. 
two things here that are so important to catch is one, remember this, everybody will get justice eventually. God says, let me be the one who brings justice. Not that there isn't a justice system. Talk about that in chapter 13. God, how he uses authority to bring about justice and to keep law and to keep things moving forward. That is part of God's grace for the world, that those things are established. But in my own heart, for me, don't make it about getting vengeance. Make it about how do I, how do I build a bridge to make it possible for this person to know the love of Christ? But they're your enemy. They're Giants fans. They're your enemy. They're on the other aisle. They're those other kind of people. They're my enemy. Oh, the moment I can get my head around that they're my enemy is the moment I can say, oh, I'm supposed to love them then. And pray for those that persecute you. Isn't that what Jesus said? Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Matthew chapter five. Oh, if they're my enemy, I know what to do with that. Love them. Give them grace. But they don't deserve it. That's why it's grace. You didn't deserve it. I didn't deserve it. And he gave it to you and me anyways, like a gift. And none of us will be able to say before God, I'm here because of the way I got myself here, because of the things I did. He says, by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. I love grace in my life. I love the grace of God that he's had in my life. Don't you? I'm so glad I don't have to keep earning earning, earning, earning my way into heaven. I don't have to keep earning my relationship with God. I don't have to keep fighting to, am I I, I okay today? I mean, what, ah. But that he gives me grace. It's a gift to be open constantly. That's the example. Corey Ten Boom, many of you know her story too if you don't. She says this about Jesus' words on forgiveness. Corey Ten Boom was in a Nazi concentration camp for protecting the Jews, hiding them. She was Dutch. She saw her sister die in the concentration camp. She watched her waste away. She watched all of the inhuman treatment that they all dealt with together. And one day, the guard that was the one leading all of it, that they had the most issues with, that guard came up to her after a service where she was teaching on the forgiveness of God, did not recognize her, and held out his hand and said, I I was in that concentration. I was a guard there. And it's so good that God, like you said, has removed our sins and cast them away into the depths of the sea. Isn't it great that God has forgiven us? And she just describes her journey from that moment and his hand out saying, will you forgive me? And what she had to do to call on the name of Jesus and say, Jesus, I I don't have it in me. I have no feelings toward this whatsoever. She said it was the coldest, iciest hand she could ever pull out, but she knew that the will could come without emotion. It wasn't gonna be the emotion first because her, as cold as can be, she reached out her hand because Jesus helped her. She said, I don't have what it takes. All this prayer happening in seconds. She said it felt like hours before she pulled her hand out of her pocket and, and put it into his hand. But she said, the moment that I did, She said, the the warmth of emotion started from the top of my shoulder and it came all the way down. And then she, we held hands and then we began to weep together. And the, the love of God in a way I've never experienced it before began to flow into my soul to bring the healing I could not get. And he experienced forgiveness and she experienced letting him go. 
She says this, when he tells us to love our enemies, he gives along with the command, the love itself. Nothing in this, what we're talking about today, nothing in this is possible without God's help. I'm aware of that. I think you're probably very aware of that. But it is very much the way he's called us forward as the church that builds builds bridges. Amen? And lastly, break the cycle. Do not be overcome by evil. And that is what he means by do not be overcome by evil. It doesn't mean don't let bad things happen to you. But when hostility comes our way, when the enemy through others and their brokenness and their selfishness, their prejudice, their pride, their anger, their whatever, their abuse, when it comes our way, break the cycle. Break the cycle by coming against it with a different way. He says, don't let, don't let evil win. You cannot win by giving back evil for evil. You can be overcome by it, and play the game. Or you cannot be overcome by it by coming at it with a different spirit. Do not be overcome by evil. Overcome evil with good. I'm telling you what genuine love looks like. I'm telling you what is possible because the spirit of the living God lives in you and Jesus has already done this for you. That's who's in you. Grab a hold of him and reflect him in the moment and it will look completely different than the way things are happening in the world today. You'll be a bridge builder instead of a terror downer. You'll close the gap instead of widening the gap in your families, in your communities. one of the best in our time and in our common era history at this was Martin Luther King Jr. And this is what he says about that. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. You can't come with the same spirit that's coming at you. You come with an opposite spirit. That is our heritage in Jesus. And this is our moment and the church's opportunity to shine. We've got to come at it with a different spirit. We cannot control what the rest of the church big C does. We cannot control what the rest of the culture does and how they're going to handle these things. But we can ask now and repent and come before our God and say, God, you have my attention. The way I live this out, how I walk this out, I want it to bring glory to you. Are you with me? Would you stand with me?